studio. I am Vladislav Yeliseev, and today um, it is uh, my pleasure to uh, introduce you to uh, Hamemil papers. Uh, first, I, uh, I encountered these papers uh, by accident when I, I talked to my friends in Europe, and they told me, Vlad, try this paper because it's actually quite good. And I tried it and I loved it. Since then, I turned to these papers. I'm buying these papers from Chief Joe and anywhere I can find it and I'm using them. Uh, today, um, I'm going to present you to our uh, presenter, um, Joe Demeyer. He, who is a North American uh, fine art uh, papers presenter. And uh, Joe is, um, received his associate degree in uh, commercial art, let me just pull this up my, my windows, in commercial art design and advertising in 1985 at Minneapolis Community College, an early start working for a local uh, art supply store. Uh, and that um, actually piqued his interest for product knowledge and te techniques leading him to a 35 year long career in the art materials industry. Personally, I talked to Joe and I was amazed how much he knows about the papers, sizing, etc., cetera, et cetera. Uh, He currently works for Hamimil Fine Art. Uh, that is a company which is 400, you won't believe it, 436 year old paper mill in Dassel, Germany. Joe has worked all uh, sides of art materials industry. It, he is knowledgeable not only in uh, fine art papers, as you, uh, as you already guessed by now, but he is knowledgeable in all aspects of art supply and artists working with materials. Joe has worked all sides of the materials industry, artist, store owner, and actually manufacturing. So Joe calls himself as I'm a self-proclaimed materials nerd and that's the guys I like. So <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me predest you, Joe Demeyer. Vlad. Hi, hi Joe. Hi Vlad, how are you doing today? Very good, thank you. Thank you. Very I understand much. Uh, it's very warm in Florida, but where I'm at right now, it's a negative eight degrees in uh, negative Minneapolis, eight. Minneapolis, Minnesota. Okay, so for watercolor painters, you mean it's hard to be outdoors to paint because you, my you water do not want to <laughs> there's no pl there's no plein air. Leave your pochade box at home. It's you don't want to go out on this. You can sit <laughs> okay. by the window though. Um, okay. If you're adventuresome, you can do that. So and and like Vlad said, I've been uh, involved in the art art supply industry since 1985. Really, uh, when I started a, a part time job in this in this world, I have worked for folks as uh, Golden Acrylic in the past, Jack Richardson Company, which I think folks will recognize as a brush company, Car and Dosh, which we know as a color company and, and pencil company. So in about 20 other uh, capacities, uh, I've worked that. Bought an art supply store in 1999, uh, decided I wanted to move back uh, to Minnesota in uh, 2014. And thankfully, uh, I fell into the art materials industry again with Hunnamill back in 2016. So I'm gonna, if I could, I'm gonna share some screen. What we're gonna learn today is, is where, where a Hana meal is being manufactured, what our history may be, as well as uh, I wanna go through the different materials that are in paper uh, from calcium carbonate, et cetera, et cetera. And then the materials that we make our papers out of. We'll see videos of two different machines that uh, can make paper for us. And uh, I'll just start right in with the video and uh, we can go from there. And, and again, folks, I have a, an associate, Carol Boss, who's on, on the chat. So if there's any questions or, or that you have, she'll be there to either answer them directly or uh, we'll, we'll, at the end of the video, we'll be able to do a question and answer period as well as if, if there's something right pertinent about the slide I'm on, please ask that question and raise your hand, okay? So I'm gonna share screen here a little bit. I'm uh, over the age of 50, so technology gets difficult sometimes. It's looking good, Joe, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> so the reason I show this slide, well, my last name is Domeyer. I'm on my first trip to Germany working for Hannemühle, and I'm taking a walk through the town of uh, Einbeck. And Einbeck is just outside the city of Dassel where uh, our, our mill is. 
So I'm taking this walk and all of a sudden I stumble upon this street sign, Doma Estrasa. It automatically tells me I've, I've made the right choice. I have found the company that I need to work for because it's in a nice German city. And I come from a small town of New Ulm, Minnesota, which is a very German community, Exprecha Bene Deutsch. So uh, we do some uh, German, but it was very uh, telling to me that this, this company uh, could be something I needed to, to stick with. Our mill next month will be 437 years old uh, with uh, uh, being in the exact same water source in Dassel, Germany. So we have never moved the mill in that 436 years. We've always been at that same source. We are still a family owned uh, corporation. So unlike a lot of the other watercolor brands and, and paper brands that are out there, we're not consumed by the board of directors or the uh, stockholders or shareholders to operate how we do our business. 435 years, this is actually just showing you a vintage uh, uh, roller or press, uh, would have been used probably around turn of the century, 1800s or 1900s. And see the large steel. Uh, it's just impressive to uh, touch and feel something as old as this, knowing that it's been making paper for that long. This is no longer being utilized making paper. So our company consists of three different styles of paper. Digital fine art has been in the United States for almost 20 years. We have been making, we took our fine art papers and put a digital coating on that product so that you can print and reproduce your uh, watercolors. You know, say you scan it and reprint it on, for instance, right up in here, and you'll see my cursor move every once in a while, uh, on our William Turner watercolor paper that has a inkjet coating on it. So if you, you're an artist and you want to start selling your product, you could put it on our, our William Turner paper or Albert Durer painters. Uh, but again, it's been around, we are the first company to do the inkjet coating on a fine art paper uh, back in 1988 or 1989. A large portion of what we do is filtration. And I have to uh, point out just above this little area here that I'm circling, those are test strips. Our mill during the last year of the pandemic has remained open because we manufactured the paper that is used in the COVID-19 tests. So we're, we're, we were deemed a, a uh, necessary company to remain open, no matter what the lockdown was, uh, we re remained open. If you have a filtration system in your kitchen for your drinking water, chances are the material that's in that filter was manufactured in Dassel, Germany by Hahnemühle. And then of course, traditional fine art. And what traditional fine art has been, it's been around since the full 435 years. We started as a mill that was manufacturing um, stationary products and art products and newspaper products, you know, items that uh, would have back in, in, in uh, 1584 would have been uh, used to communicate with the general public. Uh, water, watercolor paper at the time or paper at the time was used more by nobility than it would have been by um, the common people. The other thing we find out from here, and I'll, I'll go into another part here when I get into the materials or, or, or products uh, that are being used to manufacture paper. Our mill in its location in Dassel is a, um, it's on a nature preserve. So 80 to, or 90% of our energy is electricity and that electricity is generated by hydro. It's generated by um, uh, solar or wind power. So we have this very, very, very strong uh, environmental concerns as well with our mill. We put water back in uh, and uh, uh, put water back out back uh, into the, the Ilm River uh, as pure as it was when it arrived. So a couple of things, we are a, a limestone spring area. Um, very, very, uh, uh, you need very, very clean water. As we know, the Germans make manufacture the best beer in the world. Same water that makes the best beer and making the best paper as well. Um, so pure water is what really goes into the manufacturing of our product. 
Um, I do want to also mention to you that we have uh, been vegan. We are a vegan mill uh, and we have been vegan since 1965. So pure water is what's needed. Then we jump into cotton. Cotton is the rage. Everyone loves cotton. Cotton is what uh, is by far the best material for watercolor paper and uh, drawing paper. It allows the lead or the graphite to drag very, very smooth and very, very uh, um, uh, fluidly. It also allows uh, for better color retention when your watercolors are absorbing and your, your water is soaking in and your other water is uh, 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 going into the atmosphere. So, but if you look here, these are cotton balls. We all know what they look like. Well, that's not what cotton paper is made out of. Cotton paper, I'm waiting for a, a little window to move in my laptop here. Cotton paper is made out of the little cotton lint fibers off of the cotton seeds. So if you look at this, these are cotton seeds and all the little white fluff on there is what's actually physically being used to make cotton paper. And this isn't anything that's special to our mill versus other cotton papers, et cetera, et cetera. This is the industry standard. Uh, this is why when you see a uh, pad of paper that's made out of maybe tree pulp or wood pulp versus cotton, this is why cotton is so gosh darn expensive. Uh, it is a, a byproduct of the fabric industry, not the actual cotton balls. We manufacture paper out of bamboo, which is unusual for a, a, a fine art paper company, but we have a very, it's a very lignin free, uh, acid free product. It grows within three years. They cut it down, it grows right back. So again, with our environmental initiatives, Bamboo is a very, very sustainable um, plant material to be used to making paper. It also is about 300% more, um, cleans up more of the, air, the carbon uh, out of the air than what pine trees or poplar trees might do. So that's one reason why we utilize bamboo wherever we can. Two new fibers that I don't have slides for that are just introduced this year and I'm sure you'll find them at your dealers or you'll start seeing news about them, is we now are making a paper out of a watercolor paper made out of agave or sisal, it's known on a worldwide basis, as well as a um, material uh, known as hemp uh, because of the, it, it's a very, very 3000 year old uh, uh, paper making. It's now just become acceptable in North America uh, as an actual byproduct, and it's no, no longer looked upon as the devil's paper. <laughs> so, and then our third or final is wood pulp. Wood pulp gets a very bad rap. Back in the 1800s, when we made paper, newspapers and newsprint out of cotton paper, they lasted forever. That's why we still have better newsprint and newspaper out of the 1800s than we did in the early 1900s. Reason being is when they started switching from cotton to wood pulp, they were using the raw material of wood pulp. That raw material has acid. Well, for the last 70 years, 60, 70 years, the art industry has been able to pull what's called lignin and pull that lignin out of the wood pulp fibers so that it is acid-free archival. In fact, some of our number one selling papers in the printmaking field is known as copper plate. And uh, by far, it's, it's one of the most archival papers that we manufacture up to 300 year lifespan. The nice thing uh, are the two fibers that we tend to use is poplar trees and pine trees. Carol, how are we doing on questions? Anything coming up yet on the pulp or materials? Not on this subject. Nope, you're good to go. <laughs> so another product that gets used quite a bit, and I'll, I'll show this more in detail a little bit later, and it's called sizing. Sizing can be manufactured out of a variety of different materials. It can be manufactured out of starch, or it can be manufactured out of protein. And uh, the protein uh, materials or the gelatin material is usually a animal byproduct. We do not use animal byproducts 
in any of the product that we manufacture, including our bindings, including our glues, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I have there that we have no animal byproducts. We are a vegan mill. Uh, and that is uh, from us to the, uh, uh, or a cert certified by the German government. I have one question. What is, what is it about poplar and pine trees that makes them so good? Uh, it's, to be honest, it's the, again, the art industry, and this happens in paint as well as, as brush fibers in your brushes. We are a byproduct of the home industry. So when you look at uh, uh, poplar and pine, those are the two most forested uh, uh, and harvested and sustainable wood forests and materials that are made. It's the shredded materials or the, the, the exterior barks and the exterior sawdust, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, is what goes into the byproducts that are being made uh, by those trees. It's, they don't take a whole tree and just shred it up for our uh, industry. Same with paints. Why is a cadmium red so expensive? They don't use it in the house industry or the home industry anymore. They want to use things like pyrols, which are used widely in the home paint in the automobile industry, uh, which is why some pigments become extremely expensive when the home and auto industry stop using them. So, Interesting. So, and then the last item that we use is in, in a paper. So we really have four key ingredients. You have the, the water, you have the pulp, you have the sizing, and then you have what's known as calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate is actually a buffer. What this allows is for you to have your paper sitting out in the open air for a period of time without having it discolor. Calcium carbonate literally encapsulates the paper fiber, whether it be wood, bamboo, or cotton, and keeps it free of acids. So it, it keeps it, uh, uh, allows the paper to keep its tone. So here I'm gonna start the manufacturing process for you folks with this video. So what I'm showing here is a stack of what we call our linters. So we, we purchase our linters from byproduct mills and these linters are stacked uh, and uh, uh, brought to us via train load and uh, set on the conveyor belt. And as I play this here, I'll play it and then uh, freeze it. So as you can see, this is the fun part. This is where we're blending up that product. So we're taking our pure water we're adding sizing into this liquid state, and then we're adding calcium carbonate in this liquid state. So that way it's all in, and we like to call this the slurry or the slurry mix. Don't fall in. <laughs> uh, this is also, if you're making colored papers, if you have a, 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 there's many, many, many colored papers that are out there. This is where a paper manufacturer would also add its color and tone as well, uh, because that way it'll go through the entire layer of paper instead of just a coating of color on the surface of it. So uh, when we do our colored uh, on papers, we would just, we would add our colorant there as well. Joe, how big uh, could be this, this, container, uh, like it's hard to judge looking at the, at the video. I think if, I think, and I'll run the video again. I think if I had to put it even in, in uh, I could probably put it into gallons of around a thousand gallons. Unbelievable. Thank you. Joe, can you give a quick overview of how the archivalness of hemp and bamboo compare with cotton? Sure, let me, uh, pause this here and we'll go on to the next. So archivalness between the, the, all of the products that I mentioned are pretty darn equal. And I mean that uh, it, because we sell our products into the library industry, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's more about performance. It's not about archivalness. Uh, to remove acids from the materials in their, uh, uh, not in the slurry state, but in the, the linters, the, the sheet state that uh, we saw going into this blender, 
Uh, you really don't see a whole lot of change as far as archival uh, capabilities with today's technology. Yes, if you've got something from 30 years ago and you're working on it and it's a wood pulp, or if you're working with, let's say, um, a wood pulp paper uh, newsprint, we don't make newsprint. <laughs> it, it's, 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 it's the fact that we make every single product is acid-free archival library binding systems uh, uh, qualified with all the certification that's uh, necessary for uh, being museum quality. Um, I will talk about cotton and cotton rag. Cotton rag gets used uh, many times and we use it ourselves. Cotton rag comes from the historical back in the 1400s or the 1500s when there were actual people that were uh, uh, rag collectors that would take those rags from out throughout the city, collect fabric throughout the city, and those materials would then get beaten and uh, brought down into a slurry and made into a cotton rag, since the rag collector got them, uh, cotton rag paper. Cotton rag paper as a true, from a recycled cotton fabric, is very, very, very rare in the commercial end of manufacturing paper. So if you're looking at different mat boards or different uh, illustration boards or different watercolor papers that say cotton rag, uh, and we use it ourselves, they're traditionally meaning cotton fiber uh, from the linter seeds or from the linters that were made out of the seeds. So we go on to the manufacturing. At Hana Mill, we have two different types of mills. Uh, one is called the Fortinier, which is a very, very fast mill. And the other is called the Mold Made Mill. Again, these are very similar to other uh, paper manufacturers. My competitors will have Fortiniers in their facilities and they'll also have Mold Made. There's a big difference though in the quality of paper that each one manufactures. So I'll run the video briefly. Uh, At the beginning, you've got almost 60 to 80% water. By the time we get to this middle point here, we're talking about almost all the water being filtered out of it. Uh, if I go back a little ways here on the video, you can see this roller or this cylinder here is actually uh, pushing the paper fiber down to the mat and the water is being extracted out and you can see it falling off to the side here. So this again is the Fourdenier paper manufacturing. It's also known commonly in the, in the industry as a machine made paper. By the time we get down to this end right here, we're already got, we've already got a full sheet of paper started, uh, a long length of paper started. This little piece, and you see my cursor, I want to make sure, can you guys, Vlad, can you see the cursor? Okay. So this cursor. I do. Okay. This cursor, or this uh, um, right here is actually a water jet, and we can't see, but it's actually hitting the paper here, and it's trimming the edge of the paper. So it's all this engineering that goes into these pieces of equipment that it's amazing how efficient uh, it can be. So as we go down the line on the uh, Fortinier machine, uh, it, the paper then becomes separated from what we call the felt. And the felt is actually what gives the paper its texture. So you can see here where this is the, oops, I missed it. Right here, you can see this is actually paper being separated from the felt, which is right here. And the felt is truly that. It's a piece of fabric, a felt fabric that impressions the paper, or puts an impression on the paper uh, as it's drying. And the large drums that you see here in most cases are steam heated and those steam heated drums will uh, uh, allow the paper to dry even farther. So from the beginning of that machine to the end of that machine, you're actually seeing a, a roll of paper at the far end. So it's a liquid at the beginning, 
it's finished paper at the end. And I still like this video, the steam rising from it. So our next one, uh, the other machine that produces a premium paper is called a mold made machine. And I know that spelling is weird, but uh, that's, that's the uh, traditional European spelling of it. So our paper, Arches, St. Cuspards, many companies will use a mold made machine. Now they aren't making mold made machines anymore. So anyone who still makes with mold made is, is got a very classic piece of equipment in their uh, uh, paper mill. So you're, you've got your big 80%, 70% water and uh, fiber mix here. It'll actually go through a turning cylinder, which I, these videos were all taken by me when I toured the factory. Um, so I don't have an a, a in-depth on how it actually spins in a cylinder. So they call this a cylinder mold made machine. So this cylinder head will spin and it'll spin the water out and then transfer, as you see here, the paper actually to the felt that it's going to be drying on. I like to show the brass watermark here. Most mold made papers will have this uh, watermark and the watermark is not a stamp. It's not something that's pushed into the paper. It is literally on the felt. So when that paper settles over our rooster and shield, uh, it's a, actually a thinner piece of paper right there. This line here is very crucial. It's used when we are tearing the paper. So if you have a four deckled edge paper, the next video will show you exactly what, it, what that little line, because it makes the paper thinner where that line is, uh, what it will do. Well, this is my favorite video just because of the uh, action that takes place in here. There's our paper and boom, it's split. Mm -hmm. So one roller or this felt here is going faster than the felt before it, just slightly. And so at that speed, you are now getting a four deckled edge paper. So deckle here, deckle between there, a torn deckle, they call that. Uh, and these are natural decals right in here. So now you know how- I remember when you were at the facility, um, their question is, how is the smell at the manufacturing facility? At our manufacturing facility, it smells pure as water. <laughs> if you're talking about a manufacturing facility that's using a protein-based sizing or gelatin sizing, you have a formaldehyde smell. So anyone who knows, and again, I, I look at this as there's two different papers. Arches and St. Cuspards are both gelatin uh, uh, made or sized papers. What's nice about that is it allows you to work longer with a wet on wet technique because the gelatin base does not absorb into the paper as quickly. So when you start using our paper or an artistico, you're going to see a little bit more absorption because of our starched based or our AKD, they call it alkaline based uh, sizing or synthetic sizing that's on that paper. Uh, but this, there's very little or definitely not foul smelling. Um, it, it's it's a nice. So if you see this great little line here, this is just something the feature to show. There's actually a vacuum on the backside of this felt and it's pulling moisture out of the paper from underneath. So you ask about the different, why one machine versus the other? Well, this is just gonna show you the different speeds that these two machines go at. These machines are lined up side by side. So this video is very uh, uh, interesting to see. Now that is the mold made machine. If you look at the speed of that, it's like a, a turtle in comparison to the Fortinier made machine. So the Fortinier machine is going at about 130 meters per minute, whereas the mold made is going at about 30 meters per minute. Who cares? <laughs> why? why? Why does that matter? Um, it matters because your fibers, when you've got a machine that's moving at 130 uh, meters per minute, 
those paper fibers, and let's all pretend these are paper fibers, are going to run with the flow of the water and the flow of the machine. And so those paper fibers become uh, parallel with each other. So it really becomes a little less strength. So if you took a piece of copier paper, and I, I'll do this here, and uh, uh, I won't stop sharing, but if you look up at my screen, you tear it in one direction and tear a copy of paper in the other direction, you're always going to get a different tear on one edge versus the other edge. One will always be smoother because these fibers are laying criss not crisscross with each other. So if Fortinier runs faster, the speed of the water makes them run parallel with each other. Whereas a mold made machine goes so slow that those paper fibers overlap with each other. So if you imagine this, if you took a, uh, a Fortinier made watercolor paper and set it next to a mold made paper, here's what you get if you soak them. The one on the left is the Cezanne, or also, uh, also known now, it's being uh, relabeled as the collection watercolor paper. It is a 100% cotton mold made paper. The one on the right is the Harmony. The Harmony is our, our uh, entry level paper, and it has a uh, uh, Fortinier manufacturing. So when it gets wet and soaks for two minutes, so these are literally soaked for two minutes, you get this bridging effect that you see here versus a flat effect. Same thing when it dries. When the Harmony dries, it'll have a slight bridge to it. When the Saison slash collection dries, you'll get a flat surface to it. Um, so if, you're, if you wanna use a paper and you don't wanna tape it down and you don't wanna stretch it, please make sure to use a mold made paper. Uh, otherwise your paint will just run to the edges. <laughs> and that's not a very good painting. So there's my Prost. This is me at age five and uh, with my uncles. Having myself, uh, it might have been my first beer. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Is it legal, Joe? <laughs> well, I might have just been holding it. <laughs> yeah, they gave you just the glass. 1970, 1970. So um, that's that's really a, a story of how paper is manufactured. Uh, the, the next video would go into equipment that would show how it gets trimmed to different sizes how it would get uh, cut down and maybe padded and glued. It's fun to watch how a, 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 we talk about our paper blocks having those four sides of gluing. It's really interesting to see how they do that. Um, uh, we still have a very, very manual process where pads are stacked together, hung, and then painted by hand with the adhesion glue that goes around all four sides of that pad or that block. So question that just came in since we just saw that little video of the difference in the, between the mold made and the four denier is then would you call your harmony paper a student grade paper i don't like using student I, and the only reason i say that folks is is to use the word student means you're just always a beginner and yet the longevity and the way watercolor painting has changed vlad style of painting is a lot different than the artisan painting that's going on direct from the tube. Vlad's using water and using a lot of water. A lot of watercolorists today are taking it right out of the tube and painting it like an illustrator would. So you really, the, the paper itself based around your technique. I like to call it an entry level because yes, it's got fewer bells and whistles it's not made out of the premium cotton product. But I, I don't like using student. Uh, if it's a student and, and they want to get started, yes. But I think a student, to be honest, would be better to use cotton paper right from the start, especially if they're using something uh, or learning from someone like Vlad. Because if they want to represent what the teacher is doing and duplicate what the teacher is doing, you can't use two different mediums. You can't use an alpha cellulose paper and expect to get the same results that your instructor might be getting on the screen and or in person. And the next question is, what is the highest level grade for watercolor? 
Um, the it's a it's a small enough industry with only five people left that have mold made machines in the cut in the world um, that uh, there really isn't a series of grading papers. However, our highest grade is the collection slash Cezanne. Arches is going to be the Arches 140. Um, Artistico would be the premium for Fabriano. And um, Vlad, you might know more about the St. Cuspards. Uh, we don't see St. Cuspards here in the U.S. very much, so I'm not familiar no. with what their top of the line would be. But no each idea. one has different characteristics. Um, but yeah, cotton mold made. That's really what you're looking for on the label to be a premium watercolor paper. Joe, I have a question while, while listening to you about uh, just a limited amount of these machines in a world. Um, I mean, do you think they will last long enough so I could use to at least to the rest of my life? What the maintenance, <laughs> what the maintenance involvement in these very old machines? I think, is it really something very hard to do? And uh, you need like, you know, parts and et cetera, et cetera. I, I think you'll see... Um... The, the, uh, it, when you think of mills like the Fabriano mill and the Arches mills, they have um, mold made machines as well as extremely high end uh, newer pieces of equipment because they manufacture paper for the Euro in many cases. So they're, they're very high volume uh, mills, but they do have remote sections of the mill that are cornered off for traditional fine art products. As far as our mill is concerned, uh, we don't see ourselves, uh, you know, 436 years, we do not have the uh, uh, wherewithal to start even thinking about taking out any of our products and replacing it. Um, there's still many a parts and machines out there that uh, if, if there's a necessity to fix them and repair them, we upgrade, we've upgraded ours, uh, to be honest, at the, the tail end, we actually have a reader that'll tell us the thickness of the paper and then digitally record when it's too thick or too thin. Mm -hmm. We take it to the next piece of uh, technology that will actually trim the too thin and the too thick paper out of it before we convert it into pads or blocks. Mm -hmm. So these machines are constantly being upgraded with uh, more modern uh, uh, mm -hmm. am amenities. I have a couple of other quick questions. Which of your papers takes a lot of water and what are the weights of your papers? The, we do not make, a, a, go right out there, we do not make a lightweight 90 pound paper uh, or we don't stock a, a lightweight 90 pound in the US. Our um, best for, for tons and tons and tons of water is gonna be the collection 640 gram uh, because that 640 gram, are equal to a 300 pound, uh, depending on which country you're, you're speaking of or, or weight you're speaking of. Uh, that's really where you can just add a ton, a ton of water and not have uh, even the tape down necessarily uh, that's necessary. Um, if you're using a 300 pound or 300 gram or 140 pound, you are gonna wanna possibly tape that sheet down if you plan on using a lot of water set your water, your paper at about a 30 degree. Uh, if that's the way you want to run your, your gradations or level it flat, uh, if you like to have a, a more uh, horizontal uh, uh, spreading of your watercolor or, or tones. And Kim still is struggling a little bit, says, so the harmony is the mold made best? I'm still trying to understand the difference of the two choices. The harmony, and I'm going to go back to share screen because I actually have some slides that I, <laughs> I knew this, this may be a question. Uh, I'm going to go back to that and go here. So the Cezanne and the collection, these are the two papers that have uh, almost the identical paper in it. What we've done is with the Cezanne, we've uh, improved from it our sizing consistency. So this is our premium. This is the collection and the Cezanne. These are both almost identical papers. So we're making a transition from this particular product. So when you go to Cheap Joe's, 
to buy uh, Vlad's paper, the Cezanne is more than likely, or the Leonardo, are going to be the premium high-end cotton paper. The next series we have would be the Harmony paper. And the Harmony is again, it's a alpha cellulose machine made paper. So it is not the premium quality that the collection or Cezanne will be. And I think earlier someone had a question uh, before the video even started about uh, a third product that we manufacture and that is called um, Expressions. I saw that in an email uh, up to Vlad uh, earlier today. The Expressions is kind of in between both these papers. So the Expressions is 100% cotton fiber, but it's made on the super fast Fortinier or machine made paper. <clears throat> so what happens with that paper is with, you get the, the wonderful flow and the, the brushability of cotton and the, the uh, coloration of cotton. But if you do a lot, a lot of water on it, it's gonna do the bridging or the arcing effect uh, uh, like the Harmony might. So good, better, best. Good is the Harmony, better is the Expressions, best is the Collection or Cezanne. And I, I can tell that I use both of them. I use Cezanne initially, and then, and then I obtained the Collection and uh, papers, uh, and both of them were extremely high quality, but Collection uh, it's hard for me to judge, but when I, in, in, the, in the one video, I'm going to show you my tests uh, from the watercolorist standpoint, uh, I was really impressed with both of them. And um, if you improved your collection series, it was, I, I thought it's not possible to improve much, but I, when I saw the test, the results of my test, we're going to watch this uh, short video. Uh, I was really, really, really impressed with the quality of collection series of your papers. Thank you. And, and it's, been, it's been known in the last four to five years that I've been hearing that uh, um, all of us in the watercolor art industry needed to improve our sizing consistency. So that if you're working on the top corner up here and then you're painting down here that you have the same consistency of sizing throughout the sheet that's a difficult thing to do. That's what the collection is, is we took our Cezanne paper and said, let's make this sizing perfect. So. Thank you, thank you, Joe. And um, I think that it's time for us to, uh, just to see how in, uh, uh, how in real life test will look like using your Harmony paper. And uh, I did it for myself just to check the papers. And, uh, and then um, I show it to you. You, you I think you approved it. <laughs> uh, you, didn't, you didn't ask me to do this. Uh, the, the video which I'm going to show you, my friends, I did it for myself because I was really impressed with what I saw painting the skies uh, and, and scratching the paper and this and this. So I would say, let me just show you. It's a very short 12 min minute um, you know, uh, video of the papers, uh, paper I used. Uh, one more time, it's a hammer mill. It is 140 pound rough uh, collection series papers. And let me just try to share it with you. Hold on for a second. Let me go to this. Uh, no, that's not what I want to share with you. Hold on, stop share. That's what we're going to paint today. I'm going to show you a small demonstration with this image. Uh, and uh, to share with you, uh, I wanted to share the video with you. And I hold on, first I need to open the video. I think Joe do, does it better than me. Uh, let me just stop it for a second. Hold on, despite I'm the host and I'm going to start sharing uh, this share screen. Now we have it, are you ready? Let's start. Any sounds? Let me see. Hold on. There is no sound. I can do sound for you. Ah, share sound. Hold on for a second. There is a setting. Uh, there is a setting. It's called share sound from your video. Hold on for a second. I think I need to go to my um, to my settings here. Uh, please. 
just just a second i can i can actually do it nice let me just just uh let me just do it myself okay so basically what i'm going to do right now is, is to, to <coughs> make a make smooth a wash, wash with dioxins and violet. violet. Uh, let uh, me let share some sounds, sounds from, from everybody, from everybody else, else because, because I can, I can hear, hear echo. echo. Marina. Marina. So, so I'm, going I'm going to make, make a smooth, a smooth wash, wash here. here. Uh, uh, the paper inclined 30, 30 degrees, degrees. About, about 30 degrees. degrees. And this is the axis in violet. I'm going to do a classical wash. My, uh, the test for this, th this test is about, uh, do I see any spots? Sometimes I paint the sky. Sometimes I paint the, uh, the ground. And uh, hold on. Now it's good. Now it's good. Uh, the sound is good. And you see, this is a classical method of watercolor application from top to bottom. And you see the beads at the bottom. And now what I'm watching at, I'm watching for the spots which might appear on the paper. One more time, it's a, it's a highest line of Hamamel paper right now. And you see I'm slowly going down. This color I choose, the most difficult color to do this job is because it's highly staining color, my friends. Now I keep going down and as you can see, I'm like, I couldn't believe my eyes when I was mm, uh, making this wash, nothing. Absolutely not a tiny bit speck of something which is stand out. This is again, very, very important when you paint large areas of uh, large washes with your uh, Kalinsky brushes, etc., etc., And then you are getting some spots in the sky and those spots are not removable. The more you try to remove them, the worse and worse this wash is getting. That is, my friends, that when I finished this, I couldn't believe my eyes. Uh, there is no paper, actually, I know which would do this job as good, nothing. And that's what I'm talking about right now. I don't know, sound, I forgot. I mean, I didn't share my videos <laughs> uh, pretty much often, but I'm right here with you. Uh, let me... <clears throat> Another test I'm going to do right here is to gradate same color from water from zero lightness or 100% lightness, let's call it this way, to very thick uh, pigment at the bottom. Usually you, I use it a lot, something like that in order to gradate it. Uh, I don't paint really that way. It's a really just a test. And you see, I start with clear water at the top. Again, one more time, my, uh, my, my table is inclined about 30%. That's why I'm getting these beads at the bottom. This test is hard to do when you are trying to do smooth gradations. And you can see it's very nice, very smooth. There is, it's like absorption is very even by this paper. My friends, by no means I can imply that this is a, a standard test or whatever. It is just uh, uh, my test, the test and the, and, the, and the technique which I'm using when I paint my real deal watercolors. And uh, these actually things are important to me. I'm sure there are some uh, uh, classical tests or whatever, what it's called, like, like proper way of testing this. And I, I am uh, uh, not doing this right now. It's just, uh, again, one more time. And you, you can see smooth gradations from zero to, it's going to get very intense at the bottom. And in fact, you can learn how to apply watercolor uh, classical way on the paper. If you know French Bazaar techniques, that's what they were using. They will never go like dark like this. It would be very, very light washes, like could be 100 washes. And with this paper, I could do probably 100 washes with even better effect. So this, uh, so this bending wouldn't show at all. 
uh, but the results are incredible right now. Look at this, my friends. Another thing is I got too much suspicious about this paper and I said, okay, uh, I don't know what's going on here. It's probably, it's probably uh, a lot of sizing on the top, which does not paper, uh, uh, paint penetrate the paper too much. And uh, it's probably all stays on the surface. And that's why I get the smooth results. So um, I, I think I need to turn on there. Yeah. So over there, I was, the next step I was going to do is to check the roughness of the rough paper. And I'm going to check, that's important. I am a very bold painter. I use a lot of uh, tooth in a watercolor paper. And the more tooth paper have, has the better. And so that's what I'm going to do next. As you can see, what I like about this paper is an unevenness of that tooth. Some paper manufacturers, good quality paper manufacturers, I couldn't really fall in love because, because they have a sort of machine made tooth, very equal, it's like diamond kind of shapes. This paper doesn't have it. If I would compare to anything with this paper, I would say this paper has kind of sand quality of tooth. It's very uh, uneven, which is good. And uh, it's easy to work with. I can easy to work with. And as you can see results here are just fine. Next thing I'm going to do a dump wet on wet technique right now. So I'm with some darker color at the, at the, at the base of the green wash here and see how it goes. You see it's spreading very evenly. It doesn't collect more in one place and another. You can, you can tell just by looking at the spread that the quality of the body of the paper is very even again. Oops, I need to move these windows. They cover in my picture. All right. And so next I'm going to check probably is the uh, sword brush. How is it lines, dry brush and lines, like, you know, trunks uh, of the trees and the uh, uh, electrical poles and this and that. So I'm dragging this, these beautiful edges. Look at this. I can do very thin lines on it, no problem. Nothing bleeds around, it just stays where I want it. And what I like about it is that quality of roughness. Again, I'm getting from this paper. Okay. It's very immediate quality. It's very nice. And this is my uh, hairline lines I'm making it here. Easy to work, easy to apply. You see, very nice dry, edge, so to speak. Again, it's my test. It's for myself. I did it to check. And this is very thin hair lines, almost like a hairline, so to speak, uh, lines. And look at this uh, easy to make it like broken. So it's not like one edgy razor sharp line you see over there. There is nothing like that. Beautiful. Now splattering, let's see how it accepts just splattering. And, and as you can see the clear water splattering, now it's kind of, kind of showing more and more. more and they, 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 they stay and, and spread, spread even. even. Marina, Marina again, again. Echo. echo. Next. Next. I'm going, I'm going to... to Create, create uh, 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 Marin, Marin, can you, can you uh, uh, microphones, microphones around, around it? With, uh, 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 echo. echo, again, again. <laughs> hold on, hold for, on a for a second. Что? How? Да, ну было же нормально все. It's become very good. Okay. And I am now mixing on paper. Yellow, red, and blue. 
Might have, uh, Okay, okay, so this is, I'm showing how easily to remove a bold wash after you've done it. I'm a, again, a very powerful painter. I overpaint things. And when you do this, look at this test. It just comes out like nothing happened. Look at this. You have a small window of opportunity to get rid of this. Next step. Okay, I said to myself, let me try to wash this out actually from here, just using the water and a soft brush. Then I said, I'm going to, when it will dry, try to wash out this area. What if the paper stays on the surface only and does not penetrate the top sizing? So we're gonna do that here first. I'm taking a soft Kalinsky brush and I'm going to remove the top portion of this wash. Just about up to this line, okay? Let's see how it goes. Clear water. Uh, and I'm taking, taking actually synthetic brush, which is harder to scrub it off. And so I wet it. Okay, and now I'm removing it. I try to remove it. As you can see, nothing coming out, nothing. Beautiful, it just stays here. Then I said, okay, this is staining color. It's hard to remove, okay. Why won't we try to remove that yellow one at the, at the lower right? And so I, later I'm gonna do the same exactly thing with non-staining colors, yellows, blues slightly, and all these browns and you know mixes of green. Nothing comes out, look. Reasonably, it's just about the same. Next, I'm going to do a test and I'm going to actually wash out some color. Some of my students, they paint paintings, okay? And then, and, then, and then one part of that small part of it is say, didn't come out the way they wanted. And I recommend my students to mask some area of their painting and scrub out the paint off the surface. By doing this, it's, I call it surgery methods. You're using a, a, a natural sponge and removing the top layer of the paper. Sometimes you have to do that. And let's see how is it going to happen because it looks like the paint penetrated the surface too much and I cannot remove anything. So let's see how deep it goes. Wet it first. And then we're going to remove like a microns of top layer of this paper. Interesting test, huh? I don't know where. It's just whatever came to my mind I was doing. According to my um, experience working with uh, my paintings, with paintings of my students. All right, have a look. Incredible, isn't it? Incredible, absolutely stunning. I, I didn't expect these results, my friends. It, it's, it's, it's just, I don't know. It's just really, really good. So this is how much I was able to remove my mistakes. Let's call it mistakes. I'm going to wash out with my brush this portion of non-staining color. Maybe that will come out, I'm saying. I mean, this is, this is too good, you know, to be true. And this will come out. I, I'm sure about this. This will come out. My friends, it did not. It just was staying there. And this is again, synthetic brush, which is, has hard fibers. It's not Kalinsky, I'm sorry, I was wrong, okay? 
and this just stays there. That's it. So the, 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 the reasonable penetration of paper is occurring to the certain extent. The washes and mixes are great. Everything is uh, asking, uh, doing what I'm asking it for. I'm going to stop sharing. And my friends, I hope you enjoyed this test. Now I'm going to have a look at your questions about this test and I will try to answer them. I was really, really, really blown. When I first time I find out about this paper, I of course I dig into the uh, internet and what is it, Hamamel? I, I never heard it, and 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 then I read I read that the, the, they are actually famous for their uh, photo papers, and when I heard photo papers, I knew I'm dealing with a real deal company. Photo papers are very hard to make right, and I knew that these people know about papers in general pretty much. Let me just read your questions, and I might answer them. What kind of sponge did he use to remove the pigment? It's a, my friends, it's a natural sponge. I recommend you if you need to remove something, it's right here, you see? You go to the art store or you go to the store which sells uh, supplies for cleaning, you might find it. It's a, it's a best tool to, for removing watercolor of the surface without damaging much of the surface, okay? And removing it evenly. Uh, what brand sword liner brush did you use to paint the fine lines out there? If you in Europe, by the way, my friends, uh, I just got a note that we are being joined from 24 countries around the world, people watching us. And, uh, and, I, and then the list of countries, Spain, Croatia, Japan, Hungary, Russia, Portugal, Netherlands, France, Switzerland. Uh, if you are in Europe, you can purchase the brush from, from uh, 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 Rosemary Brushes. This is it, and this is my brush. Okay, if you're United States, you can go to my website, www.yeliseyeffineart.com, and you can just use it. This brush was developed specifically by me and Rosemary Brushes of England, and that was a product of a couple of years of research at, and, and try and, uh, and errors. Um, could you purchase the new collection, which is the same paper Vlad is using? Uh, that is uh, that is question for uh, Joe. Uh, can we purchase this new collection uh, line? Yes, the collection line, and I think Carol posted somewhere in the chat our email address. So what she can do is send you an email. We have over 17 dealers in the United States right now that have the collection line. Um, and uh, of which, uh, again, Cheap Joe's is carrying the Cezanne, which is a very, very, uh, very similar. The only real difference is that the uh, consistency of sizing. Uh, but then uh, Carol can also send you a list of those, uh, those uh, dealers um, that are stocking the paper online. Primarily, our, our uh, two key ones would be Hyatt's out of Buffalo, uh, Dick Blick, and also the folks at Wet Paint in St. Paul, Minnesota. If you're in Canada, Opus Art Supplies, Above Ground Art Supplies, and Gwartzman Art Supplies. Uh, uh, Above Ground and Gwartzman are in uh, Toronto. Opus is way out west in uh, British Columbia. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, and how do you difference between which side? side. I didn't hear you. Can you paint both sides of the paper? And how do you tell both sides You can paint on both sides of our paper. However, the surface sizing is different on one size versus the other. Uh, the size that has the, the top sizing or the premium layer of sizing, again, we do consistency on one key size that for us to be able to do a dip sizing, it goes through a vat and gets uh, sized. Uh, we make sure that it's on the level top side uh, that has most of the sizing. To tell the difference, uh, really you're looking at uh, the the surface sized or the size to paint on is what we would call the pretty side. It has much more consistent texture all the way across. If you touch it, it does feel like Vlad said earlier, like a light sandpaper. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, and yeah. would you call would you another call side, the side the next side? Uh, uh, cold cold press? press? It's, it, you know, the, the, 
the presses of paper uh, are done by the felt that we choose. So an example is, is, is in Vlad's, Vlad's very aware of this, as our rough paper and the felt that we use that that paper gets pressed against when it's in its drying stage um, is actually a little smoother than say the arches. Mm -hmm. I think you've, you've clarified that with me and I know I've had another uh, 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 email about that as well uh, last week. So uh, one side versus the other, as far as hot press, cold press, rough, um, it varies. Again, we, we don't necessarily pay attention to the back side of a page of paper. We want the pretty side or shancy side, as they say in Germany, to uh, be the, uh, the, 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 the uh, seller of the product itself. It'll have the most consistency. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe. Uh, my, friends, uh, my friends, so, so we're going, the, next the next part, part we're going, going to take a three-minute three uh, uh, break, right? and, then and then I'm then going, going to demonstrate, demonstrate your, mm, the, the painting, painting, the real, the real painting. painting. And, and all, all your questions, questions about the brushes, the brushes and paints will be answered, will be answered there, there during, during that, 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 that demonstration. demonstration. Uh, uh, I choose, I choose the, the countryside view, and it will have thin branches, etc., and so I'm going to show you. Oh, it's oh, done. It's Let done. me read, Let me read the, 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 uh, the question. question. Drop quality. Drop quality. Okay. 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 So, I think this I think is this it. Is okay. It. Why, Why won't we take, we take a three minute break? break? I, will I will find, find out, the out, the out the reason for this echo. And then, and then I will I start, start painting. painting. At the, At end, the end of the demonstration, there's going to be a raffle. And we're going to raffle. I'm a member of paper. Stay with us. У меня ничего нету, Марин, у меня нету камер. У тебя нет камеры, ты не звук, я тебя слышу.
Unmute. Hold on. All right, my friends, I'm back and um, I'm going to start painting. Let me just shut down my my background. Hold on for a second. Okay, so none and this. My friends, uh, very quick painting of this scenery and everything looks 
fine at this point. It took us a while, I'm sorry. This feedback sound is very strange and then the audio. I'm going to paint this. So I have drawn this. This is a quarter size hammer mill, 140 pounds, um, collection watercolor paper. The paints are American Journey watercolors. And that is what I'm using right now. The brushes are, I am using pointers from um, rosemary brushes right here. This is number 12, 14, and I just um, got a new brush, number 10. It's going in one pack and that's how you are getting it. The, uh, the sword brush is, has no number. It's just a sword brush with a, with a size I actually consider um, most useful. And that is, they call it a pointer or a snow, a snow drop, something like that, pointer. And that is how you will find it's in Britain uh, under this name. Again, it's a rosemary brushes over there or in the United States this. Couple of um, brushes I'm going to use, they are Kalinsky brushes. This is number 12, most useful for quarter sizes. And this is number 16. I would say right now it's too big, I think. Now I'm going to paint the sky first. And that is also like sort of a test. I will put my yellow ochre right here, okay, for the sky. Uh, it has, you can use cobalt blue here in the blue section right here. And I hope you see, uh, you see everything here, okay. And a little bit of a laserin. If I look at the sky, I see there are lots of colors. Now, my test will be next. I'm going to, and do we have lots of clouds? Not much, but not many, but I'm going to put my, some dark mix over there if I would need it. And I'm going to demonstrate for you right now, how do I paint the sky. On the lesser papers, what will happen is sometimes you get in, uh, some sort of um, spots in the sky and it's very hard to get rid of. Uh, some quality papers change their formulas, etc, etc. And I started to be very dissatisfied with the quality. First I thought something wrong with me. Then I realized it's not me, it's paper actually. I'm changing the angle slightly using this roll to about like say 20 degree, okay, angle. And I'm going to start painting the sky. I'm not going to turn it upside down or anything. The sky is blue right here. It has a cooler hue over there, warmer hue at the horizon line and a few clouds. I'm going to paint it right through the trees. I'm actually will use number 12 synthetic brush. Let me see. I'm actually a multitasking per person. I can actually, if I will open your chat, I can also keep an eye on what you're asking me. And then I'm going to look at this. First of all, let's go through the tree. Okay, like this. Then let's paint a couple of clouds here. I'm using yellow ochre, lots of water, okay. This is better view, okay. And a couple of lines here, then there, and could be another one here. Mixing on paper, using a little bit of red, okay. Look at this. Lots of water, lots of water, okay. Something like this. And actually, actually, this whole thing over there is warmer. Why won't I put it horizon line like this? a little bit warmer throughout. It's not a cloud, but. Very light amount of water here is a lot, a lot. So I'm going to use the slightly darker blue. Maybe turquoise a little bit and then darken it with this mix. Very complicated mix by now. Okay, and I'm going at the top and I'm going to apply. I should have shut down my uh, air condition, not air condition, but at least my um, 
my fan at the top. Now the left hand, I'm having these napkins and I'm going to remove water from the tip of my brush. Okay, and soften it, the whole thing. Faster, faster, I'm talking to myself because it's drying. Mm, I should have actually shut down the fan. And as you can see, you can darken the sky at the top a little bit, okay? Now it's like about, let's say 10 degree incline here. And then I'm going to use this dark area here and create wet on wet, some sort of cloud, cloudness in the shade part of it. You see, I'm avoiding the tree in terms of the, as if it's not there. I'm painting right through it, right through the tree with this darker, uh, no clouds here, or if you want, you can just add wet on wet. You see how smooth it is. It's as smooth as a butter. The first time I tried this paper, I realized, and then you see, I overpainted the Sila tower. And so I'm just taking my napkin and removing the paint from this surface. I will leave it over there, okay? Because it's probably okay to have it uh, in the red surface of the barn far away over there, you see? And so in order to get rid of this line, I will continue just this yellow wash and that's it. As you can see, very, very, very smooth, nice wash. No spots, no nothing. And the test of that, uh, the accessing before, when I did it for you, uh, it, it was showing that this paper actually delivers Deliver what I'm asking, no problem, okay? Now, I'm not touching on nothing, that's enough for the sky. I probably am going to paint the, uh, the ground at this point. That is going to be not the green one, but the ground I'm going to paint a large wash with the color of the, uh, this road, the path, the dirt road over there. Okay, so let's leave it. And I want you to see the photograph right here. Okay, so at the same time. And so let's start mixing for our ground. Uh, I'm squinting, I see it's a little bit more intense, yellow, yellow ochre, yellow ochre gold right here. I am working with American Journey and they are creating a number of paints which I'm using. And so we're going to brand them. And so, so my students could really not just cherry pick their colors, but buy the set and that would be really good. So uh, what do we have here? It's kind of, it's first I will do this wash like kind of in a warm, warm kind of very nice big wash like this. Look at this, I'm looking, avoiding the cows over there. Some of them has whiter spots. We might just use them uh, the whiteness of the paper, and I'm going to loosely, okay, loosely just apply this. I'm keeping an eye on the road here. Again, there are some cows there. You see, I'm just leaving this dry brush, untouched areas, right here, going right through the, the fence. And this area, what we can do now is just to cover it faster, faster, faster is better in watercolor, that is my personal opinion, faster is something. And then I'm going into the tree, uh, trunk again, area. What else do I do? This is really green at the, at the foreground. Never mind, I told myself, and I'm keep going. And I'm going to mix on paper, this reds and yellows. This is easy to work with colors because they're not staining. And But with this paper, I don't care. It's not staining anyway. I put some blue, some cobalt blue into, into this um, yellow ochre color and just call it a day. Uh, before it will dry anything, I'm going to take a clean napkin. Look at this again. Let me show you and remove and remove some colors from the, from the path. Look at this. There is a path, the dirt road like this like this, let me just 
make it thinner and you can still work with this. You see, there's a couple of three minutes probably left and I can get rid of this paint quite easy. That's an awesome, this is awesome thing. Quality I really cherish because one more time I painted boom, bam, boom throughout everything very fast, very, and we can now splatter this with, uh, let me see, like splattering. Let's make it really a dirt road. So I'm putting my burnt umber right here, okay? With some dioxazin, putting right here, making some warm and dark something here. Not too dark though. I keep an eye on this and this is it. Let me see. And what I'm, I'm not a good splatterer. I, I'm going to warn you. It's not really my cup of best what I do, but around this, oops, and that is too cool. This is too cool. Uh, I'm going to load it, load this paint right here, burnt umber more. Okay, a little bit with this. No rush, no rush. We have plenty of time and just slightly ta -ta 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 in this area. Ta -ta 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 -ta. Okay, in this area, and then I'm going to clean up this. Usually when I splatter, when I say I'm not a good splatterer, what I mean is when I start splattering the road, the dirt road, my splatters mostly goes into the sky. And that is really, I don't know, you need to practice control. I'm going to make it even orange, this sort of things. Look at this. Ta -ta -ta -ta. Ta 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 Splatter, splatter. Red, orange. I like that kind of orangeness in that in that area of the road. It's kind of has a very nice, nice. Yeah, something like this. Okay. I took my time to do this because actually, to be honest with you, I'm waiting when the pigment will penetrate the surface of the road. Look at this wash, nothing, nothing stands out. This is my mistake, it was too much pigment. I like to keep it here. It's going to be a large wash of, sometimes I just do it on purpose, large wash, wash of green on top, okay? Now we might use some, let me see, let me see do you have any questions at this stage? Uh, and I'm going to change my napkin and my hand, okay? Is there, sound is perfect, everything is perfect at this point. Uh, an old toothbrush. Look at that. I just thought about that and I have toothbrushes here, which I cut the handle off. It's somewhere here. And uh, to be honest with you, I tried it and it's hard to manage for me, even harder than the, uh, than the, the, the regular brush. Uh, the recording will be available on YouTube, by the way. I'm not getting an echo, but I have my mic turned off. All right, thank you so much. Don't turn on your mics, so maybe that will create some kind of echo effect. Why not seven fix echo? Yes, I'm not getting... Okay, so what I'm going to do now is to dry everything. Look at that. Right. Look at the smoothness of the first wash. Look at this color integration, red, yellow, yellow, blue, not a spot, nothing. This paper is really, really, really likable. And I switched, I, I, used, I used arches for 30 years, my friends, and something, I don't know, I just switched to this because it was giving me lately some unpleasant surprise and I, I just couldn't live with them anymore because I'm like, when I teach, I, I show, look at me, that's the way to do your, your wash, like this, like zigzag pattern and this and that. And then what I see, I see spots and then I, I, look, I look no good, I'm sorry. So this is actually uh, uh, delivers to, for what I'm asking without giving me like, you know, like a, uh, any kind of like, you know, embarrassment moments. So next step, let's make a few brush strokes in the background. 
Okay, I'm going to work on the in this area. Okay, so and let me see. I'm going to put my uh, burnt sienna here. Look at this uh, red uh, thing over there. It's kind of like a, the roof, and I'm going to tame it slightly, and I'm going to uh, use right now. Let me see. Okay, I'm going to use semi-dry brush. I hope it's, this is still a little bit wet and it shows here. I need to wait, but we cannot wait. And I'm going to paint this thing right on spot for you in a loose kind of manner like this. Now, while it's wet, let's see. I think I'm under painted it in terms of intensity of orange. So I'm mixing my orange right here. As you can see, I don't use no oranges here. I'm just using my emergency, or oh, I'm sorry, using my cut yellow, cut red. And I just dump it right here, right here. That's it. The right side of the barn is kind of cooler. So I'm just going to add a little bit of alizarin in this area. And I think I'm happy camper right now. Then we're going to paint a little bit background trees. Okay, so I'm cleaning up this part. Now the paints are high quality actually. I switched from, I used to use a German brand which is called uh, Lucas. Uh, and something, something they start making not right, right for my taste. And it becomes sandy and everything. So look at this, I'm, I'm mixing four greens. There are no green color on my palette anywhere. Cobalt blue, cut yellow, okay? Gave me green, I won. And I'm going to dump darker, cooler. Let me see. This is my, let me just mix something for darker color right here, okay? And I'm going to indigo, mix of indigo. Oh, very complicated, but nice looking darks, right? Call it emergency dark. I'll just Push it right here a little bit along with red. Okay, and that's too much red. So let me just get that green I want actually. I think I see that green, maybe cool it down slightly huh? because it's so far away. And then I need my glasses. Oh gosh, uh, talking about unprepared, I have two sets of glasses sitting right here. Let me put them on because we're now working with something and probably I will open my screen. Okay. And what I'm gonna do now is to dry brush this. Look at this. Tan, tan, a far away line of trees. Now I'm using clean water. I can soften the top, okay? I can pick up the, the, the base for this. And I'm going to, we need to really avoid going into this area at this point because it's still wet. And I see there is something there, ba ba ba. And then this line of trees continues and dry brushing. You see this tooth of this paper? It gives me everything I want. I'm going to actually zoom in slightly to this painting so you could see in detail what I'm talking about. Look at this, you see? Just about perfect. And there is a there is a line over there. I don't know, it's kind of like an overhang or something for the cows. So they could be comfortable in the shade, you know? And this is Florida farm, very hot. It's getting hot sometimes, so I don't blame them. And Ta -ta -ta -ta, and the trees over there. Ah, you can use softener, you can use any, ah, this is look, look like that. Let me just dry the barn a little bit. Just a little bit, okay. And then we're going to identify a little bit of what's going on under. It's just like very loose. This is not going to be a very 
uh, hard painting. It's going to be sort of, okay? It's going to be kind of quicky. And that is good thing. Okay, ta -ta. I'm going to paint a negative space here. And at the bottom, there is something, look at this, that something can be painted as a dry brush again. You see now how much I ask for, from paper, a lot, a lot. Dry brush, wet on wet, smooth sky, give me this, give me that. I don't know how they do it. I mean, it's a really quality paper uh, which can uh, deliver. And uh, if you can spend a little bit and this is fine. And then again, how much this cost? Come on, people. It's one quarter of the 22 by 30, right? It cost probably me $3 this piece to paint, okay? But you see how much efforts I'm in making here. So, and, uh, and so there are cows over there, okay? So there is a big cow there. We can switch to the pointer. Look at this, this is number 10 now. Let me see, if, where are you? Sometimes I think my brushes has little legs and here you are. I, it was going behind the water jar just exploring what's there. And so look at this cow over there. I'm going to like this one, okay? So it's looking at me saying look, look, moo, do, moo, do, do, do. It's a big cow, it's a big cow standing there. Okay, and like this. We can another cow over there and we have like a cow with a dark head here walking and of course they're looking for something to eat, right? So, and then Papa, some spots, some spots, another cow here, some spots on the body of them. I have so beautiful, in fact, they're so kind, so, uh, I don't know, these milk cows are very, very gentle uh creatures. And so another one, another, my head, huh? oh, look at this. Okay, we just created a staccata of cows over there. And so, and then we're going to paint the tree. The reason I choose this for you is to show you how to paint the trees using all of this. But before that, of course, a couple of cows wouldn't hurt. Uh, yes. yes. Can you show the reference photo again? Because people can for the reference right here, I'm gonna hold it right here, okay? So don't okay. paint with me, just watch, because you will do have copy of this, uh, of this recording, of this session, of this demonstration. And so I don't want any, any sort of drama on your part. Just watch, enjoy, and see how that is done on wonderful paper, which I really like, and I'm switching. And if Joe will stop selling it in America, if Joe will just, if I will have to travel to Europe for this, I will be very upset, to be honest with you. The light comes from the lab, this cow, the barrel, it's kind of barrel on thin legs or something. You can show a couple of ears and that's it, you see? And of course, tail, okay, enough. Oh no, there is more here. And they're a little bit more brown. Why won't we just start painting this little bit of, mm, I'm like, I was there like a month ago. Beautiful, so many. And nobody really objected me painting on location. It was great. You can come, the farm is huge. It's enormous. Let's put some, let's put some dubs in, in and out and this and that. And just what we have here is darkish, ta ta ta. It's a farm land. You know how good it is for my brain? Like when I'm on this kind of land, I'm getting kind of peaceful. Everything's so peaceful over there. Everything's so nice over there. It's so natural. Something probably humans have in there. But And so what else do we can do? We'll just scratch in. Look at this, the rust on the tower, okay? Like this, okay, I remove it. You see, I'm overpainting constantly things and making it dark at the bottom, okay? So how about this? A few thin lines like this, let me show you this. Let me zoom out slightly. All right, I'm working on it, okay. And a few lines like this, you know, it's a probably metal, metal something over there. Now we have a little bit darkness here, another cow there, and 
let's paint the green. Let's paint the green. I'm going to clean up my palette right here. Let's move it to the left, everything. And I'm going to mix for the greens right in front. I don't, I mean, again, don't think for a second that people who make paints like me, they don't because I prefer to mix my colors. As you can see, I don't buy oranges, I don't buy greens. I mix in them, I'm mixing them to the green. I actually consider appropriate right now. And they are like a gazillion of greens, okay? And so if I would just, all right, let's go. Buy, I won't have any space on my palette for the, any other colors. And then we're talking oranges. How many oranges there? A lot. Look at this. I'm painting on top of this, the grass. Grass area is very, very warm in the background. Okay, so, and it's a dry brush again. Look at this. That's what we're going for. Okay, let's go around the cows here. That will actually accentuate light colored cows here. Same with this. Let's go around them. Ta 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 ta. Yesterday I did paint along, and uh, and I just that the word accentuate just stuck to me, and I was accentuate. Acc I'm like oh my god! All right, so look at this a little bit more orange in this area, and just let's cover this grass to the, and I'm painting around the tree at this point, you see what I mean? Because it's going to be a different type of painting. And then I'm going to take a large brush, Kalinsky number 12, okay? And I'm going to mix more green, yellow ochre, and this and that, and I'm going to start painting this. I'm painting through this uh, kind of like, a, I'm painting right through the, right through the tree and, right through the tree. And I'm gonna give a hint of this dirty road. You know what I mean? Just a hint. I don't want no kind of, it's not about that road. It just happens to be there. You see what I mean? So dry brush again, dry brush again. And we are almost there. So this green is green. And they say green is greener on the other side, but in our case, the green, grass greener on a foreground. That's where exactly where we stand. And that is the way we're going to paint it. Look at this, ta-ta-ta-ta, ta-ta. If you will miss a few spots, it's all right. Ta-ta, dry brush, dragging the brush everywhere. And maybe, maybe it's kind of boring. It's going to be a shadow here, but still a kind of boring green. So I'm going to introduce a little bit of red, a little bit of blue in it. It's just like, you know, it's just like, you know, it's, it's like a živopis. If you in Russia watching me, think about the word živopis. In Russian, it's called life painting, painting which reflects life, okay? And that is not green. It really has green and blue and orange, red, and this and this and that. Uh, and your job as a painter for Joe, his job is to make a wonderful paper, and our job is to uh, uncover the, the richness of color and tone around us to the best we can. And that is actually what counts. Now we can splatter this. It should stay. Remember I showed you the test, the splattering was wonderful on, on, on the hammer mill paper. So, but we need to wait a little bit. It's just a little bit too wet here. I would love to splatter it with water just a little bit. While it is drying, and I will forget to splatter it, I know, because I'm gonna paint this finally, the, 
the, the, this, uh, this tree. I'm going to get rid of this green. And if I will forget, please remind me, blood splatter and, and, and that's how it's going to be. Wonderful, wonderful. Spreading, nothing, no surprises. The paper actually does what I'm asking the paper to do without bringing to the table any unpleasant surprises for me. Then I'm going to mix for something which is trunk of the tree. I'm squinting. The trunk of the tree is almost red. So I'm mixing my burnt sienna, yellow ochre gold and just go for the trunk. Tum, boom, bam, dry brush is fine. None, two, three, four. And it looks like horrific something Vlad just did, but it's actually underpaint for the next. And look at this. And then I have a chance to remove all my all my things which I think were painted not where I wanted them to do. Let's uh, this is still, that's okay. We can, we can splatter that now. Look at this. I clean my brush completely. Okay. And put my finger right here and pack, pack, pack. Not too much. And it start, it will show in a second. It's little, little dots over there. All right. So, so far, so good. What have you done here? It was wet. It's just going right in. Fine, it's great, my friend. This is what watercolor I call happy accidents and let them happen. You see what I mean? So this is really important. Next step, I'm going to dry and you can type your questions if you have any. I'm sorry, I had to dry it because there's going to be a lot of dry brushing in this area, okay? We're almost done this very quick, very uh, like kind of like, um, you know, impressionist uh, painting. Uh, why won't we just, while it's still uh, drying here, just take care of this of this picket fence on the right, not picket fence, but barn fence. So look at this, I have already this kind of browns here. Let's re replenish it a little bit, make it slightly darker, okay? and make it like this, okay? And look what that is. When I say, I tell my students, you don't know what to paint. Too many details, no problem. Paint dry brush, okay? Dry brush is not, will fix everything, but it can really, really, really might create amazing impressionist style of and look at this, pam, 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 pam. I could scratch white a part of this, but it's all right. And then you see like, boom, boom, boom. I've just placed them a little bit in a kind of manner, which is not really. So I double couple of them, make one low, high, it's there. And then what's there? There is a, actually a lot of ta -ta 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 -ta, something here, which is, I don't know what, and that's what I don't know. And I don't wanna know, I just paint it, okay? And then uh, darker green, darker green, cobalt blue, this and that into this, and swish, one, one, one.
All right, I think one, two, three, we, we're good. All right, uh, what I'm gonna do, I'll just put the tree right here in front of you and paint this tree so you could see both of them. Uh, and I'm going to exercise a looseness of brush stroke here, but most important, I'm not gonna paint the tree. I'm going to paint the light on the surface of the tree. Every time I say, when you wanna learn how to paint, you need to study and understand how the light works on that surface. And then I need a little thinking about this. What to, how to proceed from this area down or from this area up? Mm. To, 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 to do. Why won't we do from top to bottom? Uh, I just said that, that means we're going to have sword brush here. The sword brush is exactly the same sword brush. Look, have a look at this. <clears throat> After a while, the color stains this white fiber and it becomes basically some kind of weird, beautiful violet dark color. And so what do we have here? This is pretty dark foreground tree. I'm going to mix first my, my greens in this area, okay? So it's going to be cobalt blue, cut yellow. And then I see it has a lot of orange in that kind of area. And then I have my, what I call emergency dark the darks I'm using during the painting. Let me see, hold on, like here. Okay, so if I need going darker, I already have it on my palette. Okay, so. And I keep it cool on one side and warmer on another. That's why I don't use neutral tint anymore, which I used to do. All right, so I'm going to start working with this. Let's make this beautiful, that is important. All right, we made this background. So we need to concentrate on the tree. I would say it's all about the tree. Uh, the trunks, the trunks over here on my palette are going to be um, transparent, oxid brown, which I used to call um, Van Dyke brown. The blue has cobalt blue, ultramarine right here. I'm showing you my palette, okay? And that is my greens, which are not dark enough yet, but that's okay. I'm going to start with these greens. Let's see. Slightly lighter at the edge. Dun, dun, dun. I'm watching this. Okay, more orange. Okay, asking. It's asking for more orange in this area, just slightly. But you see the sky is painted. So everything you wanna do here is going to be really, really darker. So if you wanna accentuate any color, you can actually have to go slightly more intense. Now let's dump some in here, okay? Okay, look at this from that. And I kind of feel like making it more interesting. So I'll put a little bit of alizarin dump right in, in this dry brush area. Why won't we zoom in slightly? Huh? So you could see better. The palette is, okay, don't worry, like this and like this. But then you don't see this. That's good, all right. If I will accidentally run out of my space here and I paint and talk about something you don't see, please let me know. And Marina is watching, she's helping me to do that. And I'm going to dump darker wet on wet. Ta, 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 ta. Look at that, huh? And that is kind of dark, dark violet. And then with the same color, I'm going further. But this time I try to leave some, okay, some, of my, look at this, look at this paper. Look what did I remember? I told you sandy, it's a little bit sandy. It gives me that leaves, no problem. Just the way I ask you, I ask the paper, I ask for from my, uh, you know, materials 
and they just listen and give me what I want. Another one is going to be here, here, and then going to get darker and a little bit emergency dark here. Look at this, I'm going to dump a little bit of darks here. Okay, look at this. Ta 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 and just, huh? Does it look like what I'm looking here? Impression. It's impossible to paint the tree the way it is. It's only impression what I'm asking for. And then I'm going into emergency dark and look what I do with this brush. I probably would like you to see side camera right now. Oh, it's scary. Here you are, okay? So you could see the way this tip of the brush is dancing on the surface of this paper. I remove some, look at this, of paint from the tip and keep going. Oops, hold on, more. Da, 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 da. Remove and go. Look at this branch over here. It's kind of has to do this for me. Not overdo and don't even try to do what you see. It's more like try to paint impression of what you see, not real deal. Oh, ta -ta. Remember I showed you the, all of this? Ta -ta, ta -ta. Huh? Let's have a look at the whole painting like this and then uh, we're going a little bit more over here, okay? Just if you give them the impression of there is branching, half dry oak, old one, and this and that. Now I'm going to go into emergency dark here, okay? And then I'm going to paint cast shadows on the surface of the trunk like this, you see? Look at this, like a, like a shimmering effect of the of the tree let's go to the top camera i know it's hard sometimes some people so the camera is on the top left of me and then i'm going to start painting cast shadows on the trunk why won't we make them a little bit more warmer okay a little bit more as opposed to the leaves which have become gray. And you see, there's no even green leaves over there. In fact, if you look at the photograph right here, there's no green showing up almost nowhere. And then I'm going dry brushing right here. So what I'm going to do now is dry brush the shade part of this tree. Okay, like this, look at this, like this, like this, like this. Okay, I'm almost like sculpting it right here like this. And going into this area and going into this area like this, like this, like this. And that, that is the shade area. And now we're going to paint the cast shadows on the trunk with slightly other cooler color. Look at this one. And it's round, right? We want to show kind of roundness, double light on the, on the trunk and the ta-ta, 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 ta-ta. Okay. And there's roundness kind of like, don't make it like, Double light and round, you see? Okay, and then we can dump water in it. Dump water right into the dark places and that water would unify everything. Unify my darks, darks and lights and this and that. Okay, I'll leave one like bigger one, like bigger one and then unify it with this, look at this. And this is double light, like let's soften it slightly. Okay, look at this, huh? Look how the roundest trunk, a massive oak trunk appeared in this area. And then I'm going to create now area of darker like shadow here, making it rounder. And there is a couple of like this, look at this. And then we're going to let it sit like this. And then I'm going quickly, quickly just indicate some doubled light and cast shadows on this on this trunk, okay? Okay, and just don't copy that. Just give an impression, show me impression. I'm asking, I'm talking to myself a lot, show me impression, right? I mean, I hope, okay, and then dry brush on, the, on that old tree trunk. This tree is so old, so nice, it almost tells you the stories, how many cows were next to it, 
and they were just, you know, having fun. Did you see running cows when I was there? I saw running cows joyfully. This is like a, a, a 40 tons animal, okay, can run pretty fast, okay, after another cow, of course. I mean, it needs to do reason. And it's the tail was wiggling. And Blood, this, can you zoom out a little bit? Zoom out, yes. Okay. Okay. And then so this is one massive cast shadow. I group them, you see? It's not just anywhere. Oh my. All right, let's leave it alone and start painting the the uh, the uh, leaves on top of that. Okay. And so I'm taking cobalt blue into cut yellow right here and darkening with indigo, okay? And darkening with this, making it grayer somewhat, okay? Okay, and then dry brush and this, boom, boom, boom. What do I see here? Like something like this, something like this, and goes right to the trunk. Okay, there could be something else. Dun, dun, dun. Look at this paper, my friends, look at this paper. It's absolutely beautiful tooth in it. I mean, I'm not gonna bash anything or anything. I, I really wanted to like, after I got disenchanted with uh, arches, okay, a little bit, There's, I don't know. And uh, sorry, it's my mouse just fell. And, and I tried, I said, what options I do have? I don't have many options, as Joe said. You know, there's just a few machines there. I got uh, Sounders Waterford. And when I was painting this, it was very even pattern. It's like kind of a diamond pattern of things. And I just said, you know what? I just cannot make it work. For my style of painting, for somebody, it could be just wonderful, beautiful thing. But for me, thank you, but no thank you. And so this is how with I discovered this. How did I discover Hamimil paper? I'm calling my friend in Europe and I'm just asking, talking, blah, blah. And then what was my question? Hey, listen, listen, I'm just, I'm not sure what's going on with arches. What are you using? And she said, oh, you know, she probably Tatiana Anisimova uh, from St. Petersburg. And she said, you know, wet on wet, I like to use, oh, look at this. I'm, I like to use Sounders Waterford and for dry. And I'm like, oh, my ears are growing. And what for dry? And she said, that is Hamemil. And I'm like, what is Hamemil? I want to hear about it more. And then, you know, the next thing I know, I bought this paper, made a test and I'm in. Okay, so that's how, that's a story of my love story. So, and that it's kind of, that's it. All right, next thing I'm going to let me just explore this area slightly. And as you can see, I'm a painter who likes abstract brush strokes. Just like, it's not copying anything, it's just a brush stroke. Look at me, I'm an art, I'm a fine artist. I'm not trying to copy on no nothing. This is, just, this is just what I use. And I'm asking a lot from that because that brush stroke, let me just use my um, liner here. And, and so let's collect these things together. And uh, you see, I mean, you can go as complicated as you want, but in reality, I recommend you just use a little bit of that dry, of that pointer brush here, sword brush, what we call it. And, oh yeah, and look at this and call it a day, just a little bit. It's kind of, think of it as a jewelry and these lines, which this brush makes, think of it as a, as a, 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 a kind of a, a, a kind of a line where, on which jewelry is sitting, something like that. So to connect all of these bright brush strokes is very important. I'm looking from the distance Okay, and I'm going to, with a few brush strokes, I'm not, it's not my intention to create here very complete painting, uh, but the whole process, the whole process right here in front of you is actually the way to do it in um, any stage you like. Uh, detailed stage, semi-detailed, or just impressionist painting, which I'm doing right now. 
that is, and look at this, if you're going to do darker around this kind of a little bit, ta -ta 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 -ta, the trunk becomes very, very prominent. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do. And I mix it on paper, my red, yellow, and blue colors. And there is kind of like this. Tan, tan, tun. Oh yeah, oh yeah, that's what it was missing here. And that is my emergency dark. As you can see, easy, easy. I can go on this paper. With this uh, paints, paints plays a role too, you know, very important role. Uh, why won't we just splatter it? You see how smooth and this is? So if we'll splatter this area, it's gonna create a sort of, and I told you I'm a bit splatterer, uh, uh, create a sort of buffer zone between detailed and smooth area right here. I actually like it. It could be a flock of birds, but at the same time, remember I told you I, you can remove it and that is good. Last thing is I'm going to show you cast shadows here, all right? Big brush. Let's take a big number. This is pretty, you know? I, I, I don't know. Let me zoom out so you could see the bottom of things here, okay? Look at this. Huh? It's almost done, huh? All right, so uh, let me just get my cut yellow. Again, your tools, my friends, remember, do not, when I was a kid, you know, the teacher told us, you know, well, eat a little bit less, but buy your tools. If you call yourself an artist and you don't have money, okay? I don't recommend to do that, but probably I can live without extra can of ice cream, which is not good for me anyway. All right, so let's do it. Cast shadow from the tree over here. And that's it, and we, Finito, we're done. Uh, cobalt blue. I'm putting cobalt blue. It's going to be our actors on a stage. Dax is in, a little alizarin over here. Again, I will put more cobalt blue and cut yellow over there, okay? And then I will go in to restore my emergency in this area. I'm using indigo. I'm using burnt umber and the axis. Let me see, do you have any questions? Because you're probably dying to ask me something. I'm not sure, hold on. Thank you, Suzanne. Let's paint a bit of the view. Oh yeah, yeah, we already fixed that. Camera left, camera right. You do it. Lost voice, make is silent, lost audio. Yep, okay. And that is finger painting, okay? Finger painting. Don't underestimate the power of your finger painting. All right, next. Boom, 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 boom. And you see it's difference on the right and left side? Make it the same, at least somewhere, okay? Otherwise it's like, what's behind the trunk? I don't know, something happened. The leaves are different there, totally. And this is it. Now, cast shadow. It's going to be lighter, lighter. Nice, dry brushing on the right. Okay, that's why I have this kind of light side of green. Maybe we need to cool it with cobalt blue because it's cast shadow. And so in a cast shadow, dark green is, could be just cooler green, okay, why not? And so what I'm gonna do here, first of all, I pull myself back and I am kind of, I want greener green. So I'm remixing, look at this, these things with cobalt blue. It is again, one more time, American Journey watercolors and who sells it, I guess, it is cheap, Joe, online store you can get over there. Let's start. One, two, two, two. I'm gonna start thinking sometimes, so don't pay attention to me. Just watch, okay, or shut down your microphone if you don't like my singing, because actually this is the process of just like music. It has rhythm, it has louder sections, it has sections which are softer, and I am frantically looking for my, here you are, look at this, okay, a softer section right here, and then I'm kind of, Ta, ta, ta. Let's group them, ungroup them, just like a music. It's same rules, same everything. When you paint, 
you created a symphony. Okay, so ta 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 ta, and that's what I'm. And then there is we have a lot of coverage here. You know, it's like a heavy music here. You see. And then there is at the edges there is like a staccato of double light here. Okay, and then maybe there is a little bit further one or two come out. Okay, like this. All right, there could be something, by the way, different color here because it's not grass. Look at this, I put in my browns here in the surface of the road. This kind of dirty tricks comes from illustration years of mine. And so I kind of like aware of them. I don't like to use them because when you use a lot of brain, everything going down the hill sometimes in the painting department, so you have to actually follow your emotions, that kind of stuff. Okay, so basically, and then we continue with the darker green. Before it's too late, that was a test. It looks good, okay. And then I'm going to double light it here. Unify a little bit here. Sometimes people getting carried away. I call it fake brush, brush work. They carry it away and it looks artificial and it doesn't look like materials or anything. Be careful with dry brush. I mean, I know watching me, you can fall in love with this technique, etc. etc. Again, the warning is do not overuse it. Okay. It's just when it's only appropriate. And so what do I have here? I have I have a feeling that it has this color. Okay. I have a feeling that this has this color. It's actually not a feeling, it's a it's a, it's a really a fact of life here. And so I'm going to use it without much thinking. It is impressionist thing. Okay, so we're done. Next thing, next thing, I'm going to make sure that this is darker. Okay. Next thing I'm going to do double light on the surface of this trunk and I will stop right there. After that, we're going to look at this. Da, da, and that is going to collect, collect, collect. And the same color is going to go somewhere here and here and here. And I'm not going to distinguish the grass from the trunk. It's all bloody mess here, I'm sorry. Okay, so I don't want them to really look and make their you know, kind of, and make their definitions between, oh, that's a trunk stopped, or it's all elusive here. Why is it elusive? Because it's in the dark. We never really would experience that knowledge by being there, and then we need to soften, soften slightly. It's, it's too hard, so. With soft brush and this. It's got to look like the way we experience. The way we experience everything is not the way the photographs are. It's totally different kind of way of things. And, and so whenever you copy your photographs, please be very careful. It's not the way to go. Sometimes you see hyper-realistic paintings. They are not realistic because that's not the way we see when we are being in that or that or this environment. One more time, let's highlight this, ta ta, and the cows, of course, of course, they will have a little cast shadows. What's good about this brush? Without switching the brush, number 14 can create for me a very thin line, I'm asking, and oh, duh. that's a bird, that's a birdie here, my friends. I don't want to go no further. This is very, very immediate painting, okay? Designed only to show you the abilities of this watercolor paper. And I am yet to name area where the watercolor was sort of um, fighting me. You see what I mean? Uh, it's truly yours probably and Am I here? No, now this camera doesn't work. I don't know what's going on. I want to show you myself, but let me go again in this case here. It's going to be this or this, and this is the original. My friends, I'm going to 
I'm going to do a ruffle. Now it's gonna lighten up. It's just a little bit too dark at this point. So it looks at this point, it's probably way too dark. Keep in mind, this is dry, 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 and this is wet. When watercolor dries, it becomes way lighter. It's what we have to actually think about when we paint and slightly accommodate that. What it's interesting to do is actually to splatter this area while it's still wet. Okay, look at this. So I clean water, I'm putting clean water. Let me just shut down this camera and, and turn it on again because it's, it's got to be, it's got to have a view. And I'm going to splatter this area slightly, just show you how beautiful the splatters can look in this paper. Look at that, okay? This is, this is something interesting, I like it. And let me just try to go to the, yep, and you see me, okay? So this is a little bit boring, so I'm going to go and choose this background again. Uh, and that's truly yours in front of me, of you. I'm going to read a couple of questions if you have. Susan, thank you. Great demo. Going to buy a block. We're going to ruffle the block of watercolor paper right now. If you are in United States or Canada, you will receive it by mail. And the block is this. Okay, so I have, oops. I have it in my hands. Let me just turn on green screen. Okay, because it's kind of, okay. So uh, this block of watercolor paper is going to be ruffled. You will receive it by mail. It's a beautiful piece of watercolor paper. It has uh, 140 pounds, 24 by 32 centimeters, 10 10, 10 pieces and you can just will use it, okay? Uh, before that, I'm going to answer your questions. Super demo, thank you, Beverly, thank you. Uh, all panelists, Susan, great demo, thank you, Vlad. Tina, thank you, so no questions, mostly thank you and I thank you all for joining us here today. I personally would like to thank uh, Joe Demeyer, I would like to thank everybody who participated today with this, and I'm doing it only as a, no focus, right? A lover of this paper. I don't, I'm not a part of the Hanemil family, unfortunately. I'm just a user, just like you, okay? So let's, let's go and go, let's go. This is it, okay, I'm going to, uh, Shush, 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 shush. That's what we do in most of the time on my paint alongs. And we just giving away some things, okay? So let me just, okay, I just put this back. And the winner for the Hanemel paper today is Christina Cornell. Christina Cornell at gmail.com, US, United States of America. Congratulations, Christina. You will re, oops, how to make it in focus? Uh, uh, like this. <laughs> uh, you will receive a block of watercolor paper. I will give it to Marina and she is going to pass it along. And, uh, and, and, and so uh, it, you, I hope and I'm sure you will enjoy the paper. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joe. Anything you would like to say at the, at the, at the end of this demonstration? And I, uh, I just find it amazing to watch a, an artist who can do such beautiful work in such a short period of time. Just Thank you. Wonderful work. Uh, thanks everyone for your attention. And again, everyone have a very safe uh, weekend. Stay cold, uh, stay warm. Don't stay cold like me. <laughs> okay, stay warm, but not warm because here it's, it's probably too much. Thank there you, you so much, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, and I, Vlad, uh, yeah. I think you forgot the second bucket uh, for our international. Oh, there is another bucket of international uh. students right here. And our international international viewers will receive a video, video of my paint alone, uh, absolutely free. I just got somebody from here and, and, the, and the name is Willie. I cannot pronounce, I'm so sorry. 
the high seller. Uh, Willie, the, the seller. Can I spell it? G -A I mean, I think you can help me, Joe, here. D H A E S E L E I R. Yashishla? It's something like that. In the name of the God, I can pronounce it. I'm so sorry. Willie, congratulations. Please contact Marina and you will receive for free to watch my uh, paint along session, which is from Belgium. The uh, Willie is from Belgium and I cannot pronounce the name. Marina, you should, you should write me a Russian transcription on the right. So next time it would be much easier. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, everybody joining us. And I hope to see you next time. Everybody, bye-bye. Bye-bye.